magic in the air this evening, magic in the air. The world is at her best, you know, when people love and care. The promise of excitement is one the night will keep. After all, there's only two more sleeps till Christmas. My name's Candice McVeigh, and thanks for joining us tonight as we close out our series, God With Us, Part 4, Life With God, by Pastor Dave tonight. Um, I wanted to ask you guys to stand up now. And you look great. Thanks for being here with us. Greet your neighbor however you feel comfortable. Fist bump, elbow bump, just a friendly hug. <laughs> You can remain standing, let's sing together.
peace. Hail the sun, your righteousness. Light and light to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Heart the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn. Amen, amen. You guys can have a seat tonight. Luke 2, 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Pray with me. Gracious God, thank you so much for this service. This time to gather and remember what happened long ago, 2,000 years. The Savior came to the world and changed everything. Changed everything for the people then and changed everything for us now. And my prayer for all of us tonight is that we would lean into that. That it wouldn't just be another regular Christmas, but we would slow down and focus on you. No matter where we are, whether things are crazy and busy or maybe they're a little slower this year, would we focus on you, Emmanuel, God with us? 
And would your peace and joy and love surround all of us tonight, everyone in this room, no matter what they brought to this place, would you comfort them? Would you be close? Emmanuel, God, with us. We love you, Jesus. Thank you so much for this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Montrose Church, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Christmas. It's good to see you all. Um, Christmas Eve, Eve, I like that. Uh, A couple announcements. Um, Just a couple. Right now, Paige, do we have that? If you guys um, have been here before. Also, shout out to the the people who are new here today. We're welcome. We're excited you're here. Yeah. Um, so here's the right now page. You can take a f- picture with this with your phone, or you can just go to montrosechurch.org slash right now, and it has all the details about what's going on in the life of the church. Um, it has the rest of the schedule for the weekend, um, and I encourage you to go check it out. And then this Sunday, we are not having our traditional services. We're having come and go communion. So if you've been around, you know that we'll do this around this time. It's a great time to stop in between 10 and 12 and pray with one of the pastors and take communion. So it'll be a lot of fun. So that's happening this Sunday. And then we'll be back back to traditional times the following Sunday. So that's good. Um, Let me pray real quick for our tithes and offerings. And then uh, Pastor Dave will come up here after another song. God, thanks for the tithes and offerings. And and maybe the end of the year gift, too. Uh, May they all go to the furthering of your kingdom. We love you, Jesus. Amen. around the table There's so much to be thankful for It's Christmas Oh, how I've missed this But through the joy and laughter You can feel the sadness Cause it's Christmas Everyone's not with us
Amen. How are we doing? So uh, just so we know our crowd, you know, you are the type A overachievers coming on Thursday for the Friday services, which uh, either means uh, you got so much going on tomorrow that you can't squeeze it in, or <laughs> you're just clicking things off the list. <laughs> you get as much excitement of checking something off as you do of actually doing it. Do you ever wonder why the Christmas story went the way it went? Why these people who had been anticipating, waiting, looking for, longing for the long-anticipated, much-awaited Messiah, how they missed it. How somehow he showed up and they didn't get it. Maybe that's because they're a lot like us. Or maybe we're a lot like them. Maybe it's because whenever God doesn't quite meet our expectations, maybe it's whenever he doesn't behave the way he's supposed to behave or do the things that we expect him to do, then we don't recognize him at all. Later on, they did recognize him, and then when they did recognize him, they rejected him because he wasn't acting the way they thought he should act. We kind of do that sometimes, don't we? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is preaching, and he says these words, Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For whoever asks, receive. Whoever seeks, finds. Whoever knocks, finds the door will be opened. Now, I know there's a lot of caveats. There's a lot of things we should do to interpret that passage of Scripture, but that's kind of a... That's a great passage for the eve of Christmas Eve, isn't it? Ask, and you'll be given. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened. Let me just ask you, what is it that you ask? What is the nature of the asking? What is the nature of your seeking? What's the nature of your knocking? Maybe you come to church often. Maybe you're one of those folks that's been a part of this congregation for a while, and uh, somebody mentioned that they tried to come to last year's Christmas Eve. How do you remember that? We were doing, this time last year, we were meeting outdoors, and uh, we had a big Christmas Eve planned, and I don't know if you remember this, this is our new Christmas tradition, rain. And we got rained out last Christmas Eve. And uh, so I don't know if you've been coming for a while or if you're brand new, but I believe whether you're new or you've been around a long time, we all ask. We have some things going on inside of us that we want. What is the nature of the thing for which you ask? The nature of the thing for which you seek. It doesn't take long to narrow it down. I don't mean you have to get really super specific, but most of us long in general areas. Some of us long financially. We are always asking, seeking, knocking about things that are financial. Trying to figure it out, trying to make ends meet, trying to find a little bit of security, trying to catch our breath or save up, whatever it might be. Some of us are asking and seeking And it always has something to do with relationships. We need some things to get healed. We need some things to get fixed. We need them to work better. We need people to be nicer. We we need something about relationships. Some of us, it's it's about healing, whether it's emotional health or physical health. That's the thing that we are longing. It's the thing we seek. It's foremost. And generally, anytime you get sick, I'm sure you've experienced this, uh, that moves right up the top of the list. It gets right up to the top of the list. What is the nature of that thing for which you seek? The thing that you are asking. That you've narrowed it down, and and somewhere inside of us, we've started to say, if this thing worked out, if this circumstance changed, if if this part of my life got better, then the rest of it would come together. Then, Then I think everything else would fall in, but it's this thing that gets my brain, it gets my, you know, attention and my longing as I think about what it means and how it all fits together. So when you think and you begin to kind of put that together, listen to this little quote by a doctor named Susie Cassim. The spirit is one of the most neglected parts of human beings by doctors and scientists around the world. Yet it is as vital to our health as the heart and the mind. 
It's time for science to examine the many facets of the soul. The condition of our soul is usually the source of many of our sicknesses. And I wonder how much of our sickness has to do with longing. How much of our discontent has to do with longing. So I'm going to ask you two questions. Everybody doing okay, by the way? Are you all right? I got to tell you, from up here, you seem subdued. (laughs) And I don't want to hurt you. I mean, I don't want to disturb you if you're resting. I, I, you know, this Christmas Eve, we all came for kind of a warm moment together. So, you know, if it's a nap, I bless you. I, I'm, a, you know, people need rest. But I do want to ask you two questions. And the first question will sort of come out uh, of the blue. And then uh, a lot of you folks that come to church, you'll be all pious and all uppity and all that. But don't be because there's a second question coming and it'll make you feel worse. So... So have a good attitude on the first question, because there's a second question coming. I'm just trying to warn you up front, okay? So here's the first question. How long do you think people can go on longing without looking toward the divine? How long do you think people can go on longing without looking for the divine? I don't know about you, but I feel like we live in a culture that's full of longing. I feel like I hear it, I see it, it doesn't matter what I tune into, it doesn't matter if it's sports, entertainment, politics, there's this tremendous amount of longing. We're going to fix this, this is what we're after, this is what we're going for, this is what we need. We need more of this, we need less of that, we need some of this, we need some of that. It's a culture full of longing. In fact, what we're being told a lot of the times is if we'll just get into the activist side of things, if we'll just advocate for whatever it is we most believe in, whether it's the environment or our our racial equality or justice or whatever it is, that if we just got into all of that, then, then ultimately we could fix it. And how long is it that we go through this process of believing somehow that the longing can ever be satisfied without a divine source? That's a question where you shouldn't get too pious. Just kind of sit in that space for a little bit. John and Charles Wesley are two very important people from history. Uh, You could argue that they changed the course of human history. I think had a tremendous impact on it. They lived the entire 18th century, uh, born early in the 1700s and died late in the 1700s. Interestingly, Charles was the youngest of 18 children. John, his older brother, by a few years. And the two of them were raised in an Anglican home, a home of an Anglican priest. We're told that Susanna Wesley, uh, the mother of John and Charles and the other 16 children, spent an hour a day with each child, nurturing them in her own love and affection, but also in the graces and in the teaching of the Word. So we're talking about some kids who are really sort of, you know, they grew up in the belief system, dad a priest, mom nurturing them daily. The two kids grew up to kind of follow in the footsteps of their father. They, they became, you know, really great theologians. They both attended Oxford and then graduated from Oxford, ultimately came back to teach at Oxford. So here were two young men teaching the theology of the church, teaching about God. They knew a lot about God. A lot about what God was doing in the world. A lot about what the Bible said about God. But Charles and John were very unique. And the two of them discussed often and wrote often about their discontent. About how they never felt like they were getting what they were supposed to be getting. Like something wasn't working for them in this belief system. This religious thing that they were a part of. They became missionaries. Left their teaching jobs. Came to America Savannah, Georgia, decided that maybe if they evangelized the Native Americans, it would make them feel like they were accomplishing something, that maybe God was meeting their needs in that deeper space in their journey and in their life. Uh, Their missionary journey was a dismal failure. They arrived back in London, and in the year 1738, they began to really search And they fell in with a group of people called the Moravians. And the Moravians were known as great mystics. They were kind of the, you know, the big uh, charismatic worshipers of their day. And John and Charles, as they kind of got involved with the Moravians, they started to see this kind of 
something going on in them that they had never personally experienced. And in that year, 1738, as they both sought and prayed, they each came to a moment where they sensed the presence of God in their heart. John would later write, As I sat, I felt my heart strangely warmed for the first time in my life. Forty years into his Christian experience, for the first time he felt like something happened to him. Charles in that same year had a similar experience. It was in 1738, in about November, that Charles really felt for the first time that he experienced the presence of God, that all of this stuff that had happened before finally started to make some sense to him as he had a personal experience with Jesus Christ. And so he sat down, and he tried to capture in words what had happened to him. He wrote these words. You already sang them tonight. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful, all you nations rise, join the triumph of the skies, with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hell incarnate deity, pleased with us in flesh to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Charles, trying to capture for the first time this other thing, this thing other than religion. So the first question was, how long can we go on longing before we turn to a divine source? But here's the second question. How long can we go on being religious without encountering God? Without knowing Him? Without having something happen to us? Not just observance, not just knowledge in our head, but something personal that speaks right into our heart and our journey and our life. This celebration, Christmas, Emmanuel, God with us. It's not about us coming someplace to find God. It's about God coming here to find us. It's about God coming to find you, your journey, your life, your story, your stuff, your longing, the thing for which you ask, the thing for which you seek, the thing for which you knock. Whether you think about it at church or you think about it somewhere else, we all seek We're longing for something. And the message of Christmas is that God's moving in there. That's where he's showing up. Well, I need to clean it up a little bit. Listen, you're not going to surprise him. He won't be shocked. That God wants to show up in your story, in your life. These last few weeks, we've been talking about all the postures you might take with God. You know, sometimes we live life for God. Like, we think the very best thing we could ever do is serve God. Sometimes we live life from God, where, where really the amount of our religion is about we need to get some stuff from God. And when God doesn't give us what we want, we get disappointed. A lot of us just quit. We just quit going to church because God didn't give us the things we wanted. Some of us live life over God. We, we think that the Bible and church and religion is just a system. And if we play the system right, then God has to do what we want. <laughs> we kind of live life over God. Sometimes we live life under God where we think our whole task is to find out what displeases God and what pleases Him and don't do the things that don't, dis- that don't please Him and do the things that do please Him so that in another way, when we do all the right things, He's kind of obligated to help us out when we need it. But none of those are the story of the Bible. The story of the Bible is God with us climbing in to your journey and mine. So important is this, <laughs> that the angel said it this way. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, Matthew 1, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David... Don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son. You're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. I think sometimes when we enter into this Christmas season... In fact, uh, this isn't part of the sermon, so 
And tomorrow, you know, we'll do one of those online things where I can't really talk about this. So That's another reason you come to the first service in a series is because none of us really have a plan yet. We're still working it out. But I kind of had one of those days, you know, where absolutely everything went wrong today. Absolutely. I mean, like comically, except it wasn't funny. Have you had those days where you go, if this wasn't happening to me, I would laugh, but it's just happening to me and it's not funny at all. Not at all. So uh, I was going to wear a green shirt tonight because right now I just look like a disembodied head up here. <laughs> you know, I was just <laughs> saying a little color would be good. I look like a stagehand now. But I pulled out the green shirt and started to iron it up a little. And guess what? Big stain across the front. I mean, just, just came back from the cleaners. That was fun. So then I threw a little fit and threw it in the sink and went and got the black sweater and thought I'd better iron and see what I can do. So I leaned on the ironing board, which in our house is a very old house, and it folds out of the wall, and the ironing board collapsed. I mean collapsed, like on the floor collapsed. The iron fell on top of my pants, which were laying on the floor. It wasn't an actual fire, but there was the smell of smoke. I'm not making this up. I think you think I'm embellishing this story. I am not embellishing this story. And I, as I was thinking, I was like, I am in no condition to go talk to a crowd of people about the love of God. <sighs> I'm just kind of run it in my head. And then I think, you know what, that's exactly what this is about. It's about God with us. It's about God showing up on those days, in those places, in that, in that spot where your insides are just so anxious, so upset, so right on the verge of losing it. Because <laughs> that's where I need God to show up. I need him in those deep, deep places. Let me ask you this. I don't know all the gymnastics we go through to meet the deep longing of our soul. But how often are you ever just quiet? How often do you just let God find you? Where you stop long enough and you're quiet long enough to just give space in your busy, busy brain and heavy heart and crazy schedule and nutty relationships to where God could be with you. Not you figuring it all out, not your brain doing all sorts of gymnastics, not even convincing your heart or your mind or trying to muster up your faith. Just for five minutes, being a lost sheep and letting the shepherd come find you. A few years ago, Dan Rather, well, quite a few years ago, Dan Rather was interviewing Mother Teresa. Live interview. And he said to Mother Teresa, what is it that you are saying when you pray to God. And on live TV, she said, oh, I don't say anything. And Dan Rather said, oh, sure. <laughs> well, what is it that God says to you whenever you're praying? And she said, he doesn't say anything to me. And clearly, on live TV, Dan Rather didn't know what to say next. He sort of skipped a beat. He sort of stumbled for his words. And she said, and if you don't understand that, I cannot explain it to you. I'll tell you what I want for Christmas. A new posture with God. One in which I just get quiet. And I let him come find me. Where I understand that I am a being that is full of longing. I want all kinds of things. I want them, you know, the older you get, I think sometimes the more mature your longings get. Is that, is that true? I think that's kind of true. Okay, maybe it's not true. But the longings never go away. They may change in nature over time. And how long can we be longing before we look to a divine source to meet those needs? Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. It matters what we ask. It matters what we seek. It matters where we knock. 
But how long will we be content to be religious without experiencing the presence of God? We're going to close this service in a moment. In fact, I'm going to invite the band to come back. If you're not up on your liturgy, we're officially ending Advent. The four Sundays preceding Christmas Day are the season of Advent. They're a season for us to prepare our hearts. And then on Christmas Eve, at midnight, we light the last candle of the Advent wreath, the fifth candle. It's the Christ candle. Of course, it symbolizes the coming of light into the world. It symbolizes that the people living in darkness have seen a great light. If you stick around all the way to Easter, you you might experience on Good Friday that this candle, in a liturgical church, this candle burns at the front all year long. On Good Friday, that center Christ candle is carried out of the sanctuary to symbolize the death of Christ. The good news is it's back Easter morning to celebrate the resurrection. Traditionally, this candle lighting service dates back centuries. For centuries, Christians have been gathering on Christmas Eve or the eve of Christmas Eve, lighting the Christ candle and then taking out a little candle, touching it to the Christ candle, and then touching it to one more candle and to one more until the light spreads around the room. It symbolizes two things. Number one, it symbolizes that just a few people sharing the light can make a giant difference in a dark world. That can be true in your own home and in your own family, just you sharing your light in these next few hours. And isn't it interesting? (laughs) Sometimes Christmas is really hard to let your light shine, isn't it? Because people can be annoying. (laughs) What better time to go out of this service and say, you know what? I'm not going on my own. I'm not going for God. I'm not going from God. I'm not going over God. I'm not going under God. But I'm going to invite God to come with me. And I'm going to invite him to be with me. When I mix up the gravy and... When people eat the dessert, I was saving for myself. I'm just going to let them be with me. The second thing it symbolizes is this. If you're quiet and if you wait, the light will come to you. Right to where you are. You don't have to move much. You don't have to know much. You don't have to think much. God loves you like that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son to be close, to be with, to be with you in the places where you knock, in the places where you seek, in the places where you ask. Pray with me. God, in this moment, we're inviting you to do work in each of our hearts. What we're asking for Christmas is a different spirit and attitude, a spirit that is quiet, a spirit that is welcoming to you. And so as we celebrate this moment, we light the final candle of the Advent wreath, the Christ candle. And we give you thanks that the people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A new light has dawned. And we give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Everybody said together, amen. This ceremony used to involve fire. Now it involves electricity. So be sure you play along.
I want to ask you to stand. And I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. And I'm not going to send you out into this rainy weather. And by the way, we're not getting a white Christmas, but we're getting a wet Christmas. And in California, that's, a, that, that's like, man, we're cashing in. <laughs> so uh, to send you on your way and to give you a little energy, you can keep those candles. You can keep them up high. You can move around if you want. Uh, we won't say dance, but you could dance if you wanted to. So... <laughs> Let's celebrate. Merry Christmas. God bless you. Joy to the world. Let's lift it up. Joy to the world.
God bless you guys.